coming at um, Catholicity from a confessional reform perspective is not nearly as easy as it used to be. Uh, on the one hand are those who are suspicious of anything that would call itself Catholic because of uh, some rather basic misunderstandings of the meaning of the word and the function of it throughout the history of the church's faith and life. But even among those who embrace the term and do so with an informed grasp of its importance to early Reformed ecclesiastical and theological developments, are uncertain what it means today to identify as a Reformed Catholic, however much William Perkins may have given that term uh, justifiable fame, and however much the Westminster Assembly may have made it abundantly clear in their deliberations that they wanted very much to be seen as Reformed Catholics and embracing uh, critically yet truly uh, the rich tradition of the church's faith and life. It's difficult because especially in our day as Reformed Catholicity has become something of a trend, um, it has become important to uh, explain what one means by this term, not only to set oneself apart from others as though there's some inherent uh, glory and honor in doing so, but really to explain uh, how our conception of Catholicity, in fact, fits a distinctively Reformed orientation to the Church's identity, faith, and life. And yet, in a way, that does not misunderstand what it means to be Reformed in a way that would suggest that Reformed is something novel, something new, perhaps, to the 16th century, because this would, in fact, empty the term Catholicity of any meaning and any substance. Catholicity, in other words, still is, as it long has been, notoriously difficult to define. Avery Dulles, in his influential book, The Catholicity of the Church, identified five major usages of the term. One, as the opposite of sectarian. Two, as universal as opposed to local or particular. Three, as true or authentic, as contrasted with false or heretical. Four, as valuing visible mediation through social and institutional structures. And then finally, fifthly, the title of the church governed by the Bishop of Rome, as it calls itself the Catholic Church. Well, what I would like to do this evening is uh, lead us into a sustained consideration of what seems to me the obvious, at least natural, point of departure for thinking about the meaning of Catholicity. And yet, for reasons I don't yet understand, um, has not really figured at all in any contemporary substantial discussions of Catholicity, and particularly among recent proposals for reformed Catholicity. And that would be the church father, the apostolic father in particular, who gave us the term Catholic, Ignatius of Antioch. As Steve Harmon argues in a helpful article exploring the dimensions of Catholicity in Ignatius's work, Ignatius envisioned a Catholicity that was not only quantitative, in the sense that it includes the whole church, but also one that was qualitative. In other words, that by Catholic, Ignatius intended not merely the fact that the church is universal, but that the church is who she is as she partakes together in the fullness of faith and order and pattern of life, which is visibly expressed in one specifically Eucharistic fellowship. Now that final remark is deliberately provocative because while Eucharistic fellowship may sound to some uh, reformed ears as a Roman Catholic way of speaking, in fact, this is where we need to remember something often forgotten. Often forgotten, that is, about what we mean by the Reformed tradition at all. The Reformed tradition, as it took its historical point of departure in the 16th century, 
did not begin in any meaningful way as a tradition on the basis of the sovereignty of God, the doctrine of predestination or of election, uh, did not uh, distinguish itself along the lines of what would be called later on total depravity or particular redemption or limited atonement. It didn't take its point of departure as a particular understanding of the doctrine of Scripture or even, generally speaking, of the doctrine of the Church. The Reformed tradition has its origins instead in the question of Eucharistic communion with Christ. The Reformed tradition began as a alternative or variation on the question of how we enjoy communion with Christ at the table. Beginning with the consensus to Gerinus and Zurich, the Reformed tradition was a competing claim to orthodoxy regarding how Christ is present to and for his church at the table. It was set opposite, in other words, the Lutheran, as it would come to be called, the Lutheran tradition, not along other lines, at least at first, but principally and originally as a different perspective and a different set of commitments regarding what all the reformers regarded as central to the church's life and faith, how Christ is the food and life of the church as expressed in its understanding of Eucharistic fellowship. If we're uncertain of this, we only need to read what the Lutherans were writing against Calvin, Peter Martyr Vermigli, and others, and we only need to read Calvin's own shorter writings, his writings against Westfall and Hesusius, to, to notice that this is precisely how they understood the stakes of these differences. To the regret or the lamentation of all of the parties involved, who all expressed a desire that there would be no lasting division among them, there was in fact such a division. And we call one party, one result of that division, the Reformed theological tradition, which again originally was a point of view on how Christ is present to his church at the table. We call the other main perspective on that question, and the tradition which came to embody it over time, the Lutheran Reformation tradition. In other words, at the heart of the Reformed tradition as a historical reality is a commitment to the real presence by the ministry of the Holy Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ of the Christian confession, whose real human body is necessary, according to Calvin, Vermigli, Bootser, and on into the tradition of Reformed Orthodoxy, whose real human body whose authentically circumscribed human body is necessary for us to have assurance of our salvation. That communion that we enjoy with Christ at the table, it was insisted, does not come about through the mingling or in some other way a communication of the natures of Christ in horizontal interpenetrating relationship as it was understood the Lutheran and other models to, uh, to argue. But instead it was argued that it's the special work of the Holy Spirit who unites things otherwise distant to lift the church by faith through his ministry from earth to heaven, to commune, yes, spiritually, but really with the ascended Lord Jesus Christ who remains and always shall be the incarnate God-man and that in our communion with him as such, and only in such a communion, do we really know life. With this reminder of the origins of the Reformed theological tradition, which, to be sure, does not overlook the fact that in time, that tradition would come, come to be defined by other things as well, we are led to see the confusion in our day regarding Catholicity from a perspective that might end up serving us well in appreciating the origins of the term. But in order to appreciate this, we first need to take a step back even from these considerations and note that there is confusion regarding the true criterion of orthodoxy 
throughout the visible church today, and that this crisis involves the loss of a sense of proportion resulting in many derived doctrines, real yet secondary truths, commitments, positions, or ideas occupying the space or the role of what should be the church's criterion. This is a crisis in its own way of Catholicity, a failure to have a sense of proportion. Well, how does the Reformed Church in particular know how to distinguish authentic Christian belief and practice from what is not, from what has no claim to such authenticity? Is it the magisterium? Is it some theological principle such as justification by faith alone, the sovereignty of God, aspects of the doctrine of scripture, or, more and more popularly, some social or cultural program identified as at the heart of the church's mission. Here, I think, is where Ignatius can be very helpful to us. Ignatius was an early second century teacher and bishop in Antioch whose introduction into the Christian lexicon of the word Catholic was tied to his concern for what this proper criterion is. The key passage is, of course, his letter to the Smyrnians 8.2, where he says, in brief, wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Again, the key statement which brings Catholic into Christian vocabulary is this one. Wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. But what exactly does he mean by this? How is the use of the word Catholic here informed by, perhaps even determined by, the surrounding context of these words in chapters or sections 7 and then 8.1? And to what extent does the fact that Ignatius says not Jesus and not Christ, but Jesus Christ, to what extent does his choice of words there figure in what he means by Catholicity in the first place? That's our quest this evening as we enter into the world that is captured for us in this signal moment in the very, very early church in a time that mirrors our own in some frightening ways. Ignatius lived in an age very similar to ours. His society was avowedly pagan and pluralistic. The church was threatened by persecution from without and division within. A chief threat to the church was pluralistic syncretism, which was poised to disrupt and dissolve the church at a time when the first generation after the apostles was trying to preserve the faithful deposit that they had received. Around the year 110 AD, Ignatius exhorted by letter each of the leading churches in the regions through which he was passing on his way to his own martyrdom in Rome. In these letters, we find a clear, a compelling, and I would suggest an explosive vision of the church and of her faith along the lines of her Catholicity. Now, the traditional interpretation of Ignatius's words here in Smyrnians 8.2 places the emphasis on the bishop in his ecclesiology. And it's not very difficult to understand why. Allow me to read uh, the first and second sections of chapter 8 for us now, and you'll notice why the bishop has been fronted in readings of Ignatius here. We read from Ignatius chapter 8. See that you all follow the bishop as Jesus Christ follows the Father, and the presbytery as if it were the apostles, and reverence the deacons as the command of God. Let no one do any of the things appertaining to the church without the bishop. Let that be considered a valid Eucharist, which is celebrated by the bishop or by one whom he appoints. Wherever the bishop appears, let the congregation be present. Just as wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. 
It is not lawful either to baptize or to hold an agape without the bishop. But whatever he approve, this is also pleasing to God, that everything which you do may be secure and valid. You can see then why the traditional interpretation would give so much attention to the role of the bishop in Ignatius's argument. There's no question that the bishop is indeed a key to his theology of the church as one reads his letters as a whole. He insists throughout these letters that Eucharistic worship, which remains his preoccupation throughout this letter, is valid, is sure, is trustworthy, only when the bishop or someone that bishop appoints is present. To be sure, it is critically important for us to appreciate that there's a context for such a concern. And that context is that in Ignatius' day, he is learning of the now common and yet frightful practice of many schismatic groups to meet with the church for some things, but then to go off into their corners and celebrate the sacrament without the bishop's involvement, and in many cases, in rebellion against that local bishop. The reason for these schisms is also very significant. The reason reflects what was the case already in the days of the New Testament and evidenced in Paul's letters, where Jews and Gentiles had a great deal of difficulty appreciating the admittedly world-altering truth that they were both truly one in Christ Jesus and neither had the spiritual advantage over another. This remains a problem after the death of the Apostle. It remains a problem into the days of the Apostolic Fathers. And as we will discover before very long, a certain species of Jewish would-be Christianity is the special concern in Ignatius's insistence on the bishop, and yet that insistence is something that requires closer inspection. There is more than meets the eye here. The bishop's importance is, as we read Ignatius as a whole, still a derivative importance. Derivative, that is, to the true criterion and substance of Catholicity, what makes the church the church. The bishop is undoubtedly important, and yet it's clear at Ignatius, the bishop does not constitute the church. Well, Ignatius also frequently admonishes his readers to hold on to the true teaching of the church, her orthodoxy. And so some have suggested, while the bishop is important, it's in fact the church's teaching or orthodoxy understood along those lines that is the real criterion of Catholicity for Ignatius. For instance, in an illuminating passage from his letter to the Magnesians, 11.1, he says, quote, I want you to be firmly convinced about the birth and the suffering and the resurrection of Jesus Christ our God, which took place during the time of the governorship of Pontius Pilate. These things were truly and most assuredly done by Jesus Christ, our hope. And from this hope, may none of you ever be turned aside. Now, I mentioned this quote in particular, and I read it in full for us, so that we will notice what will later be explained, that in this one statement about what the church believes, he has referred to our Lord by the name Jesus Christ twice, not as Jesus and not as Christ, but as Jesus Christ. Now, for Ignatius, this is, among many other summary expressions on his part, the teaching of the church. It's what distinguishes the Catholic or Orthodox Church from heretics. And yet, even this teaching that is understood as didactic content, as Orthodox teaching, focused as it is on the true and real incarnation of the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, is still at least slightly derivative of what Ignatius has in view with respect to the Church's Catholicity. Only slightly derivative, but still somewhat derivative in a way we will soon appreciate. The criterion of Catholicity for Ignatius, 
particularly in Smyrnians 8.2, is not Jesus, is not Christ, it's not even Jesus Christ as an item or a datum of orthodox teaching per se. It is, as scholars have noted in a compelling way, specifically the Jesus Christ of the Eucharist or of the table. Remember that the context of this entire section, as well as the context for the preceding section, chapter 7, and the concern not only throughout this letter, but in all of Ignatius's letters, is the aberration of a body, a community, calling itself the church, and yet celebrating or participating in the sacrament in a way that is disorderly and inconsistent with the church's identity. In fact, the stress on the bishop would appear to be derivative along these lines. You have to have the bishop at work, you have to have the bishop ministering, not because the bishop constitutes the church, but because in a nuanced and properly understood sense, the table constitutes the church. You can have preaching or teaching outside the sacred space of the assembly of the church. The book of Acts, after all, includes as a record of its sermons preached by apostles Peter and Paul, only examples of sermons preached outside the gathered assembly of the church. You can have preaching outside the sacred assembly. You can have praying outside the sacred assembly. You can have giving. You can have praise. You can have confession of sin. But one thing you cannot have outside the sacred assembly and still be thought of as the church is the table. Because the member does not rule the table. Christ does through his appointed officers as they administer the table to the flock of God. And so for this reason, the very idea of communities assuming to themselves the name of church while they celebrate the sacrament in a disorderly way that runs against the grain of the orthodox confession of the church regarding Christ is scandalous for Ignatius. The Christ that Ignatius has in view as present in a way that determines Catholicity, so that where Jesus Christ is present, there is the Catholic Church, is specifically the Christ of the table. Not the Christ of one's ideas, not the Christ merely of one's doctrine, but the Christ as confessed by the Church, who is personally and truly present to his Church at the table. Now, how this would function as a criterion for Catholicity for Ignatius still requires explanation. But for him, we note at least at, at, this, at this first stage of our exploration that what makes a community truly Catholic or churchly is not just any would-be Eucharist, but that particular Eucharist alone at the heart of which is the life-giving and church-forming body and blood of the one confessed not merely as Jesus or as Christ, but as Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone familiar with the primary texts of the 16th century Reformation, and especially the texts at the heart of the origins of the Reformed theological tradition, will be learning very little that is new here. For this sounds like it was lifted directly from Calvin's second admonition to Joachim Westfall. But this is precisely why it's so important for us to appreciate. What Ignatius is saying here will in fact set a trajectory that finds beautiful fruition in the time of the Reformation and enjoys further development beyond the Reformation and, God willing, even into our own day but only as it is in Ignatius' own day a detonator of sorts, of Ignatius' own Eucharistic vision for the Catholicity of the Church, which sets off a series of devastating explosions for the world surrounding the Church in his and in our day, and which pulsates with the specific originating commitment which gave birth to the Reformed theological tradition that the Lord Jesus Christ of the table, 
is the Lord Jesus Christ who there forms the church and orients her to the world, to the very cosmos, and gives to her the meaning and the end of history. Not in any respect divorceable from the word as it is proclaimed verbally or orally, but precisely as it makes that proclaimed word visible and palatable as Christ gives himself most fully to his people. To understand how this is detonating in Ignatius's day and potentially for our own, however, we have to understand why he would name Lord Jesus Christ in that way so relentlessly. The better we understand what kind of Jesus Christ Ignatius is concerned to insist upon, the better we will understand what he means by Catholicity in the first place, which requires that we enter into the classic question, who are Ignatius's docetists or docetists? To cut right to the chase, which is to bypass reams and reams of often very interesting and useful literature, I want to note that I find uh, the work by Michael D. Golder immensely helpful on this front. One of the classic problems in Ignatian scholarship is what precisely did the docetism that he relentlessly critiques and condemns, what did it consist of? Golder's thesis is that the docetism, which is a general category to be sure, the docetism is in Ignatius's context and in the context of many of the apostolic fathers, a particular species or form of it that goes by the name of Ebionitism or Ebionism. This proposal was first suggested in 1672 by John Pearson. Michael Golder has revived the uh, theory and provided a great deal of documentation for it. This is important because Ebionitism or Ebionism is an old Jewish Christological heresy which has arguably rather conspicuous roots within the New Testament itself as a form of Judaism the Apostle Paul is dealing with in some of his most polemical epistles. Ignatius had himself visited the church in Philadelphia, and while he was there, he experienced heated resistance by certain Jewish Christians. In his letter to the Philadelphians, 6 through 9, we learn that people there taught Judaism, including some of Gentile birth, who he calls the uncircumcised, and that they, ref they refused to regard the Gospels as Scripture, the writings as uh, uh, Ignatius's language um, uh, indicates. Instead, they gave authority only to the archaea, the word used for the Old Testament writings. Now, it's sometimes thought that Jewish Christianity was limited only maybe to the churches of Philadelphia and Magnesia, so if there was an Ebionite problem, it might be limited only to these two cities. But in fact, as scholars have shown for some time, there are indications of this same problem in many places. Importantly, when Ignatius addresses this problem in his letter to Smyrna, he fully expects that the Smyrnians will be persuaded of his argument simply by listening to the Old Testament itself. By hearing it in the church, hearing it read in the synagogue, this should be sufficient. Ignatius demonstrates, uh, illustrates, what in fact the New Testament leads us to expect, that the Old Testament scriptures have an abiding witness to the Lord Jesus Christ with and alongside the New Testament scriptures, and that their witness to Christ does not fade away, but instead is sealed by the function, the special function of these New Testament scriptures. Ignatius fully expects they have the scriptures they need to be persuaded of what kind of Messiah Jesus of Nazareth is. And yet he also does direct them to the Gospels, to our New Testament, to the tradition and the proclamation he had received orally and in some cases uh, apparently with portions or entire examples of what we call New Testament writings, even in his very, very early day, where he shows uh, knowledge not only of First Corinthians, which appears to be the text he's most indebted to throughout his writings, but also of other writings of Paul and uh, Matthew's gospel at least. 
in these New Testament writings or the tradition and proclamation of the New Testament gospel, it is made clear, Ignatius insists, that Jesus really suffered and rose again. In other words, it appears that these troublemakers in Smyrna, in Magnesia, in Philadelphia, in some way did not regard the Gospels as Scripture any more than the Judaizers or Ebionites did in the Philadelphia situation specifically, and along Christological lines had fundamental errors or flaws which threatened the very reality of the Church as the Church where they are found. What is it that disturbed Ignatius so greatly, then? Well, the central concern is already suggested in his opening chapter to the Magnesians, in which he says that he prays that there may be in the churches Henoson, Sarkos, Kai, Pneumatos, Iesu, Christu. Unity or harmony, oneness, unity, in or of the flesh and spirit of Jesus Christ. And then the letter to the Magnesians ends in the very same prayer. Now, it is far from uncommon, at least I hope, for pastors to pray publicly for the unity of the churches. But we have to think it's at least a little unusual to pray specifically for a fleshly union or a union as it pertains to the flesh. What exactly is Ignatius so concerned about? The key is in the name Jesus Christ. It's an often repeated formula throughout Ignatius' letters, which was not in keeping with the Judaizers' Christology, their docetism, to speak generally. In Trallians 9.1, Ignatius says, quote, Be deaf, therefore, when any man speaks to you apart from Jesus Christ. Somehow the docetists speak apart from Jesus Christ. How so? In Smyrna, chapter 2, Ignatius says, quote, Certain unbelievers say that he suffered in semblance. These unbelievers or faithless ones, as he calls them, I believe, with Golder and with Pearson, were specifically Ebionites, which explains Ignatius's reluctance to use the single term Jesus or Christ, each of which appears only five times in all of his letters. Instead, he speaks of Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus, about 130 times. In fact, he never attributes to his docetic Ebionite opponents the view that Jesus seemed to suffer. Instead, it is always Auton or Jesus Christ, who he says they believed only seemed to suffer. The Ebionites, in other words, were saying something like this, We can infer this not only from Ignatius, but from Irenaeus' extensive descriptions of the Ebionite heresy. They would say, of course Jesus suffered on the cross, but Christ had left him before his passion, and Christ only seemed to to have suffered. These Ebionites, according to Irenaeus, who circumcised their sons, followed Jewish customs, use only Matthew's gospel, reject the Apostle Paul as apostate, and pray towards Jerusalem, these Ebionites supposed that Jesus had not been born of a virgin, but was instead the son of Joseph and Mary, conceived like all the rest of mankind, and had been more righteous, more prudent, and wise than other men. And after his baptism, and at his baptism, it is Christ who descended from the supreme power into Jesus in the form of a dove. And then he, as he is now possessed of Christ, proclaimed the unknown father and performed miracles. But in the end, the Christ then departed from Jesus, and then Jesus suffers, dies, and is raised again. 
but Christ, he remains untouched by suffering, apaphe, since he is and was an eternally spiritual being, untouched by the infirmities of flesh. This is what the Ebionites teach. So in light of this, we notice that the period during which the Ebionites claimed that Christ possessed Jesus, which is the period from his baptism to his passion, is the same period noticeably excluded from Ignatius's confessional sayings. I'll give you four examples. One, this is again Ignatius. For our God, Jesus the Christ, was conceived in the womb by Mary, according to a dispensation of the seed of David, but also of the Holy Ghost. And he was born and was baptized, that by his passion he might cleanse water. Another one. Be ye fully persuaded concerning the birth and passion and resurrection, which took place in the time of the governorship of Pontius Pilate. For these things were truly and certainly done by Jesus Christ, our hope. Another one. Jesus Christ, who was of the race of David, who was the son of Mary, who was truly born and ate and drank, was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died in the sight of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth who moreover was truly raised from the dead, his father having raised him. One last example. He is truly of the race of David according to the flesh, but son of God by the divine will and power, truly born of a virgin and baptized by John, that all righteousness might be fulfilled by him. Truly nailed up in the flesh for our sakes under Pontius Pilate and Herod the Tetrarch that he might set up a sign unto all the ages through his resurrection. Again, each of these statements which summarize what Christians believe, a confessional catalog, summary statements of the Christian faith, in every case, Ignatius consistently excludes the period from Jesus' baptism to his passion in order to say what is true of Jesus Christ, not Jesus, not the Christ, but Jesus Christ, where the two are united in one person. He avoids or excludes the life of Jesus, his miracles, and so on, because this is the period Ebionites seize on in order to say this is the time when the Christ is visible. The Christ, the divine element, is performing miracles, performing wonderful signs, speaking marvelous things, but only as he descends on Jesus at baptism and then is removed or leaves at the Passion. Given that this is the period of preoccupation for the Ebionites, Ignatius focuses on the other parts of Jesus' story in order to signal this is true of the one who is Jesus Christ. Now, having read these summary statements from Ignatius, there is something else that we should notice as well. This is also the period, baptism to passion, that is missing from other summaries in the very early church of the Christian faith. In examples of what we call the rule of faith, whether they are found in Tertullian or many in Irenaeus and others as well, this is con conspicuously the consistent theme. There is a movement from the virgin birth of Jesus to his baptism and then all the way to his suffering and passion, crucifixion and resurrection and appearances. And it won't surprise you in light of this to notice that this is also true of what we call the Apostles' Creed. In fact, what I would suggest is that it's very possible that behind what we call the Apostles' Creed is this, yes, rule of faith tradition, but a rule of faith tradition that has a particular context and a polemical aim. And that the reason the Apostles' Creed and other early summaries of the Christian faith 
omit or exclude the life of Jesus from their confession is not because they thought it unimportant, but because it had a strategic polemical aim to exclude what was among the most powerful and destructive of early Christian heresies, which survived the days of the apostles, survived the days of the apostolic fathers, and continued to have destructive effects through the first couple centuries of the church. The very time the phenomenon of summarizing the faith for baptismal purposes flourishes, so that one identifies as a Christian in orthodox terms precisely by confessing Lord Jesus Christ in a way that no Gnostic, no Docetist, and no specifically Ebionite ever could. Ignatius never refers to any event between the baptism and the passion. When he says, Jesus Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, he's referring to the passion. For Ignatius, Jesus Christ was and is a single physician to heal and restore and make whole. Unlike the Ebionite view of a split person who is a fleshly Jesus temporarily possessed by a spiritual Christ, Ignatius insists on the one Lord Jesus Christ, in whose real and abiding flesh and blood the church lives, because she confesses him in his integrity and unity as the only Savior of men, because she believes in him and communes with him who only as the continuing incarnate Lord raised from the dead in flesh and blood can be the bread of life for his people. At the table, you cannot be an Ebionite. You cannot be a Docetist. You cannot be a Gnostic. And this is why Ignatius points to the table to say where the real Jesus Christ is defined along these lines, understood in these terms, confessed in the integrity of his divine human person, two natures in one person forever, to use the language of the later creeds. Wherever Christ, that Christ, is present, now we're talking about the Catholic Church. But a church that would confess a different Christ and would presume to commune with that different Christ as the true Christ whether in a Eucharistic context or any other, is a pretending church. The person of Christ and his integrity as the God-man who continues in flesh and blood to be the life of his church is the sine qua non of Catholicity. In other words, for the church to be Catholic, she must take his body seriously in two respects. She must take his body seriously in the sense that she must take his church seriously. That wherever his church rejoices in, by faith rests in, and confesses this same one and only Lord Jesus Christ of history, and does so in faith, in hope, and in love, with the grain of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we must recognize his body. And at the same time, it means that Christ's body, in the particularity of his flesh and blood, the materiality of his person, which continues in its material glory at the Father's right hand, is an indispensable feature of the church's faith and life. Whereas the Ebionites taught a non-bodily resurrected being, Ignatius insists on the united sarkic pneumatic reality of the one Lord Jesus Christ who gathers his church catholically around himself in word and sacrament. The word declares who he truly is and confesses him in keeping with the truth. The sacrament, when it is that word made visible, coheres with that visible word and enlarges it for the life of the church so that the church may metabolize the word and Christ she receives into faith and hope and love indeed. 
This is confirmed by Ignatius' almost unvarying and dogged attachment to what should become a precious thing to us now, the double name of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, by which we with Ignatius exclude the Ebionite split division from the Catholic Church, which I suggest, if we were to pause over and do justice to it, would aid the Church today to exclude as well all other kinds of heretical refusals of the meaningfulness of the body, both the meaningfulness of the Church as the body of Christ, and in a day of gender and transgender confusion, the meaningfulness of the human body as well. If the confession, Lord Jesus Christ, means anything on Ignatian terms, it means that the body of Christ as a real body matters, both in the literal sense in that it is material, and that the fact that it is material is material to the Christian faith. That the body matters. Every time the church comes to the Lord's table, she is refusing Gnosticisms of every sort, refusing that ideology and that philosophy of human flourishing, which would suggest that what you think is what you are without remainder, and that what you believe in your head is all in the end that matters. Instead, at the table, the church confesses that she is not a body that depends and lives only by ideas or doctrines embraced or believed, but she is who she is as the church as she embraces the meaningfulness of the circumscribed real human body of the God-man. And therefore says the body is, as created, a meaningful thing. What an opportunity then the church at the table has in our day to say something compelling to the anxious world around us not only about the meaning of Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ, whom we might now relish to call by that name, but also the meaning of our own lives, as we may be related to him by faith in the ministry of the Spirit, so that we, in faithfulness to Ignatius' gospel-driven concern, might respond to his admonition properly, and at the table, make visible that we will be deaf when any man speaks to us apart from Christ Jesus. And that if either one or the other speak not concerning Jesus Christ, that we will see in this the unmasking of them as faithless. Because where this Eucharistic Lord Jesus Christ is, there and only there, can be the Catholic Church. It is, as the first instance of the word Catholic in the Christian lexicon, in Christian literature, to be sure, a point of departure for what we should think of when we think of Catholicity, that there is, in fact, a Christ of Catholicity. But, brethren, I suggest to you that if we do our history well, and we think theologically and responsibly about the richest texts of our own tradition, not least the very language of the Westminster Confession of Faith and other Reformed confessional documents which insist on the reality of our communion with Christ at the table, then we will hear in Ignatius' words what any Reformed Catholic should hear, the point of departure not merely for Christian antiquity, but for Reformed Christianity, which is Reformed precisely because it endeavors to be the most faithful expression of the faith of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I suggest then, in these few and admittedly scattered remarks on Ignatius, that we see in among the oldest of our forefathers a way forward in the most contemporary of our moments. Thank you.